then we just had a little girl a month ago. Oh. Yeah, December 8th. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. so you're getting uh, some sleep now, right? I'm getting, <laughs> idea, yeah. I'm getting some sleep. Uh, but she's not alone. My mother-in-law is visiting and helping. So it's two birds of one stone. Uh, I get to wait in one time. I tried that, but I'm nice, but I, I came back and my wife would never do that to me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. well, she may do that. Yeah. So this may be my last trip. Forward. No, no, I could do it, but just not the mother-in-law, right? <laughs> right, right. Like, just give me like three days in January, Vegas, don't worry. You know? Never mind that we're in the hotel with the adult entertainment. Oh, no, 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 I haven't told my wife that. Yeah. <laughs> but I was naive to it. I thought, oh, this is just Vegas. This is how they dress. <laughs> Welcome to our CES panel on the Metaverse, hosted by EMD Electronics, a business of Merck KGAA, Darmstadt, Germany. Uh, I'm Cody Goff. I am Ashley Hamer, and we are science and technology journalists and your uh, moderators for today. And on our panel, we have Richard Harding, head of AR VR business development at EMD Electronics. We have Jacob Woodruff, head of technology scouting and partnerships at EMD Electronics. And uh, we have Lars Johnson, VP Product, Marketing and Business Development at MetaLens. And our virtual panelist is Julian Wu, Head of Fabulous Account Market Strategist. <laughs> Sorry about that. Head of Fabulous Account Strategic Marketing at EMD Electronics. Awesome. So let's kick things, well, yeah, let's kick things off. So, uh, so Richard, there's a lot of new companies focused on the metaverse. Uh, why are they focused on the metaverse if they're not in the gaming world? I think the, the metaverse is a lot more than just gaming. Because, I mean, gaming is an important part, right? It, it's enabling many, many things. But there's a whole learning experience and uh, an immersive experience you can have. So, for example, in the medical profession, you can actually uh, use the, the VR world to practice neurosurgery before you really let loose on a patient, which is probably a nice thing to do, right? So that you can, you can do that. The, Oh, it's on. It should be. It's on. Yeah. It's on. Just yeah. We'll just keep going. The 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 virtual audience can hear and they can okay. work on it. Yeah. Sorry. So the um. As well as that, you you can sort of, uh, as a physician, you can work, uh, with things to understand mobility issues, for example, and understand how you may treat people better. So there's these sort of medical applications that that are there. You can also have industrial applications where if you want to design a new plant or you, uh, like in our life science business, you're looking for, for lab water applications and things. You actually can see this uh, with the customers in real, uh, by VR, before they commission it. So you can take them through it, see what it looks like and, and train people on. And these are just you know, examples now. What what we really believe is that it's going to be the communication device of the future. That you will you will have something that's you know like the, the form factor of your, your glasses. You will put these on. You can be anywhere. You can just wear them, and you will have a full immersive feeling. Uh, so you could be in a, a virtual meeting. You could be in a different place. You could be at school. You can learn how the Romans lived, the Vikings were, and, and everything. It's it's all there for the taking. So everything that you can do today in a 2D world and the, the internet should really be the 3D world in the metaverse. And, and that's where this is going. Great. And Jacob, what? where are we now with this technology and what are the big challenges that we need to overcome to get it to the next level? Actually, I think Julian would probably be best suited to answer that question. I don't sure. know if Julian, you have any off anything to offer there? Yeah. Julian, do we have you on it? Yeah. Um, so, uh, 
So the challenge, I think, um, let's start. The way we see it is that um, the market is still small today, right? Because there are many technologies in the race. We are collaborating with our key customers to have strong commitment on those developments. But one of the key areas we are working on is the material for the web guy and the light engine. So our R&D team in the US, Germany, Japan, and Israel are developing new materials for different approaches. Um, for example, we are being a leading provider for active display material for decades, um, such as reactive messaging technology will use for uh, holographic uh, optical design. In, in addition, um, patterning and uh, thinking technology from semiconductor will be adopted for uh, service grade, uh, service relief grading design. We also call it SRG design. And uh, um, to go one step further, um, both optical elements require higher refractive index substrate, and this is also a difficult part. So we are working on the high refractive index coating material um, that can give the um, webguide manufacturer more flexibility in design. And those materials are also uh, in R&D activity today. So we are likely to be, uh, uh, they are probably will be realized in uh, device around three to five years. And um, other than the uh, optical related materials, uh, it's also very important that we are um, also developing new material for thermal management. Since putting all process communication IC chip and uh, uh, optical engines uh, and components in the tiny area of the glass may generate a lot of heat. So you don't want to cook your brand when you wear uh, the AR glass the whole day, right? And then uh, such as um, advanced packaging and the stretchable material for wearable devices are also in our technology roadmap. So we are glad to work with our customers to develop uh, the innovation uh, materials to enable the AR, VR device performance to the next level. Great. I, I would just add that I think that shows a very unique part for END, where what we, we listened to from Julian is an example from our displays business, which is one of our businesses, and also the semiconductor, which is the other. And so we have both of these areas and a leading solution provider for both of these different areas. Uh, and this is something that uh, not every other company has. I think we, we may be even unique in, in this, uh, this part. So it allows us to really understand the, what's needed for the device and the design as we're, we're going forwards further. It's helpful. So, uh, you know, let's talk about a little bit outside of EMD. You know, Lars, obviously, uh, working at uh, Meadowlands. Can you tell us about just your, what you are seeing from your perspective? You know, first of all, a little bit about what Meadowlands is up to right now, and then what challenges are you seeing in the AR VR space uh, right now that you're trying to overcome? Yeah, thank you, Cody, and thank you, EMD, for uh, having Meadowlands join this panel. Uh, we are a Harvard based um, spin out um, working on meta surface optics. Meta surface optics, also known as flat optics, have very unique capabilities compared to traditional optics. We are replacing multiple lenses in a stack with a single flat optic. It gives significant advantages in height and capabilities to manipulate light. So that's what we do. What is the key application? It is really 3D sensing. Because machines that the metaverse are based on are nothing if they can't sense the environment. They can't be contextual if they cannot interact and seeing is the most important sensing modality that you have. Machines need to see too in order in augmented reality to be able to overlay the real environment with your virtual devices. In virtual reality you need to see so you don't bump into things or you can play with your partners in multi-user games. So seeing and sensing is super important. What we do with flat optics is we allow machines to see better, more clearly, we have much higher field of view in flat lenses, and all that results into very small optics. So instead of having lenses that protrude out of your device, they can be seamlessly integrated without protruding from the form factor, 
making it very small and affordable by being able to do this with a single piece of a metal surface. So kind of like what Richard was saying with the glasses, instead of having a huge piece of hardware on your face, you can, you can make it very thin. Absolutely. Nobody wants to carry the weight. It's very uncomfortable. It's very bulky. In general, the industry is trying to shrink things, improve performance, and metal surfaces in the optics space are really one of the leading solutions driving in that direction, and, and we are right in the middle of it at Metal Lens. And it's able to both detect what's happening outside and project it to the actual user that's wearing the device. Yeah, I would say when it comes to projecting to the user, there's display technologies like wave, wave guides, etc., that can be integrated into what looks almost like a seamless glass lens that can then display like people have it as pop-up display in their cars. If you try one of the new Magic Leap headsets or so, um, very, very sophisticated materials technology enables this kind of capability in an almost transparent lens setup. That, however, is not what we do at Meta Lens. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> I think uh, EMP is much closer to that action. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's, let's turn back to, to Jacob. So as head of technology, partnering, uh, scouting and partnerships, I mean, what do you look for when you're looking for people to work with in terms of the AR, VR, Metaverse space? Sure. Um, so in my role, yes, it's it's all about uh, you know what's next, and you know uh, innovate. We're, we're looking at innovators such as Meta Lens, uh, who are disrupting, uh, you know, the industry. And so, I think flat optics is one of those disruptors where you have so many applications. One of those being AR VR. Uh, yes, the first step is to uh, enable. Uh, the sensing of your your world so that you can overlay the digital world on top of, of the real world uh, for the metaverse and augmented reality but also uh, you know beyond just shrinking these devices uh, to become a better form factor it also enables uh, new kinds of sensing so not just sensing of the world but also of the user so you know you have four uh, inward looking cameras as well to to watch where our eyes are looking so that you can better uh, you know, display that digital image and prevent nausea and, and whatnot, but also you know, potentially looking at how the, you know, what, where the, the person's gazing to understand what they're focusing on and providing new data and new information. So I think all of these unique flat optics and, and uh, you know, technologies can enable new user, user cases. So, um, so you know, when we look at what innovation is going on externally, I, th I think, as I mentioned, this is a very hot area. People are trying to push very hard at shrinking these devices. Probably the most bleeding edge um, form factor that I've seen is from Mojo Vision, where you know, they're looking at putting an AR device in a contact lens. They uh, won CES award, I think 2021 here, as uh, in Innovator Award. I had a chance to meet with their CTO, Mike Weimer, uh, early last year and, and try this device. So trying to miniaturize the display, micro LEDs directly on the, on the pupil, all of the sensing batteries and communications on a contact lens is really the extreme, right? So we're not there yet, you know, from a, a, a product perspective, but there are steps down that road. And, um, you know, I think, Right now we have AR, VR glasses with video through, uh, such as Meta's, uh, Cambria, some you know a, a, a soon to be released Apple device. Um, but these are big goggles that you stick on your head, right? And so the question is, how do we get to these glasses, right? And there are companies that are looking at the uh, diffractive waveguides, such as Displex, which joined us last year, um, and are looking to do that. Uh, but there are also innovative companies. Uh, that are here uh, looking at new new ways to uh, get those uh, displays into the user's eyes. Uh, there's a company called Gletton AR who's using pin mirrors I just ran into earlier today. Uh, at, and then uh, we also have you know spoken with Cura, who's a startup that won uh, best in CES last year. Uh, you know, with some uh, geometric waveguides. So many different options on the display side and sensing side. But uh, something that we haven't really talked about as much is around the com compute 
and, uh, and energy and heat management of these devices. What's unique about AR devices is that these devices are always on. They're always sensing the environment. They're having to make sense of the data in real time very quickly. And it's very different than a traditional compute laptop or phone where you are, are doing some uh, process on, on that device and it, it ramps up the compute, gets hot, and then it can kind of pause and cool down a little bit. That isn't the case for these headsets. And so uh, we, what we see from companies such as Microsoft with the HoloLens is they're generating custom AI chips to handle all of that sensing load and uh, understand, for instance, the world locking and where you're looking and how to optimize the display on top of the world in real time very quickly without relying on the standard uh, compute SOCs. I think there was some, um, an interesting quote that if you were to rely on the standard SOC to do all of that compute uh, without these AI engines that you would require a car battery to run these devices. So obviously not something you can put on your head, something that's gonna generate a lot of heat. So these are you know, all, you know, several technologies need to come together to make this experience uh, you know, uh, the best where you can have these glasses. And that's where AMD Electronics is trying to play both on the semiconductors, the heat management, the optics, the displays, uh, and partnering with innovative companies uh, such as MetaLens. So. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, uh, and since you mentioned AI so many times, I have to shameless plug. Uh, Twenty-four hours from now, we're going to do an AI panel. So come back for that, please. Um, but you know, Richard already mentioned that there's a ton of applications. And we've all talked about the form factor a lot. Do you think the form factor really just minimizing and streamlining it, is that really what's stopping the metaverse from like just really breaking out? Because you already kind of got the use cases for it, right? I think uh, from, from my perspective, it's, it's beyond the form factor. I mean, the form factor is, is a convenience. Um, it's also around affordability. So uh, if you can engineer waveguides and other parts of the device to a certain price point, then you can expect a big consumer adoption. Uh, and so, so this is another part of it. And there's also, yes, we have devices today, but when you're wearing them, uh, there's, um, you can still imagine a better immersive display. So, uh, and that's why uh, Julian was mentioning about the high refractive index materials, because with those, we, we want to push to be more, uh, a bigger field of view that you would have. So as uh, replicating what you and I would have now, just, just here, but in the, the actual AR device. So, so this is uh, still a work in progress. It's where we, things are still developing to. And, and there will be a point at which it, the price is right, the performance is, is correct. You, you don't have the car battery or equivalent great big heavy battery that, uh, that uh, Jacob was saying, you know, because wouldn't work. And when all of these things come together, then I think the, the equipment, the headset equipment, will really facilitate the use. Because if you look at the uh, what's needed for behind for the metaverse applications, it's there, right? People are playing in the metaverse today. It's it's how that it's really made into this uh, like a big consumer um, adoption, and, and this I think is the, the key point. Yeah, you mentioned uh, you know bringing down the price point will lead to more consumer adoption. One of the things we were talking about on the gaming panel is how actually how introducing some of this technology into stuff that people are already using can you know you have that mass market uh, production that can bring the price down already and that can lead to adoption. Are there any um, efforts in that area to just put put some of this technology uh, into everyday products? You, if you look at what where we're working with our partners, I mean that's the the aim, right? We don't want to make new things continuously just to make make sure. new things. But what we we have to realize is the performance is still not quite there for the the optics that we can have that within a reasonable form factor. And when you start to then get the optics right, the price goes up. So it's the not only the the materials but how things are produced as well. The, what's needed to to produce them. So we're also, when we develop our materials, we're very conscious of that. So we will 
for example, within our semiconductor materials business, we've got um, great expertise on photolithography, and this is one way that can be used for making uh, surface relief grid. We also have uh, a facility on inkjet printing, so we can look at adaptive, uh, uh, sorry, at additive approaches for, for making devices. And we question, could that be something that we use uh, that would make things more affordable in the future? So it's a case of bringing what we know, but knowing that we still have to adapt things to, to for the future, for the, the need, because without the increase in the refractive index, we're not really going to get that increase in the field of view, the, the, the true immersive theme. Eli, uh, ELI 5 question, explain to me like I'm five. Refractive index and grading. Can you just kind of explain okay. those at a so, basic level? Yeah, so the refractive, once you uh, consider what you need, you've got to actually get the light from uh, uh, a source to the eye. Right? And depending how you, you structure this, there's a certain way you can actually allow the light to pass to from from a device, uh, from a, a light engine or a, a source to the eye, uh, and this is uh, called a waveguide. And, and sorry, one, one way of doing that is with a grating, so it's like a structured thing. And then you consider the refractive index, and if you look at how the, the sp how the speed of light travels through your structures, that, that's governed by something called the refractive index. This is about the speed of light. Like the difference between putting light through water and putting it through correct, air. Correct, yes, where you see the stick bending. And it bends, and, yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah. Got it, thank you. I was going to ask earlier if we would get to the form factor where like your glasses, for example, that you're wearing right now, like that could be, they could be, that could be like a, an AR, VR kind of like device. But then we already answered that with the contact lenses a little bit. Oh, wow, no frame. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a few years out, but yeah. A few years out, I love it. Um, so uh, we do, I see a lot of people out in the crowd. Um, we do have a microphone floating around somewhere. Does anybody have a question for any of our panelists? And then you can find the person floating around with the microphone and then ask that. Uh, I'll turn it back to you in just a second. Sure. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's all, uh, again, like to go kind of back to the discussion that we were having earlier about, uh, about gaming and like, it just gets so much of an emphasis. Um, do you, do you see like a lot of the inbound, uh, you know, pitches essentially coming in from the metaverse, like really around gaming? Are you seeing a much uh, broader diversity coming in than like one casual observer might expect? Yeah, I, I do think that gaming is, is probably the most obvious uh, application because there are already communities built around uh, metaverse uh, 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 applications such as Roblox and some of these other uh, you know, uh, uh, Minecraft and these other uh, opportunities for people to go in, interact with each other, and uh, you know, and build a world right uh, that's digital. But for me, the most ins inspiring or um, impactful application of these types of devices for metaverse is we've built so much value in the digital world. Uh, and how do we interface that digital world with our everyday world, right? So we've, we, we have all of this information flowing, we have art, we have entertainment, and, the, and we have communications. So how do we more effectively overlay that digital world to our real experience in a way that we can more naturally interface with it? So I see it as the next generation of, of interface with the digital world. And uh, I think we saw that last year with CES. There was a lot of interesting talks around, you know, beyond just the glasses, you know, projectors, uh, uh, NFTs, Web 3.0, all these things that essentially make the digital world more tangible, right? And and have us interface in a, a more real way. I think that adds, you know, uh, value overall uh, to to our culture. It will probably change the way that our culture is experienced, right? Like, if you look at education, we've got people on class on Zoom all day. If you look at work, we've got people working remotely on Zoom all day. Like, it seems like the next logical evolution, right? Instead of like sitting and looking at a flat screen with all the people you're interacting or just, with. Or looking at a square, right? How much of our time, it, everybody's day, is spent looking at this little rectangle, right? So how about you put your heads up, you know, you interact with people, and then you get that additional benefit of information 
through glasses or uh, many other uh, you know routes to interface with the, the metaverse. Yeah. yeah. When you each talk to your colleagues, your friends at a cocktail party about like your work you're doing in the in the metaverse, essentially, like uh, what's the most surprising thing you tell them, or what are people generally most surprised by? Where you're just kind of like it's obvious to you, but maybe a lot of people aren't thinking about it. Um, so, speaking on behalf of MetaLens and the optics piece, when we have discussions like this, it's about what's not yet possible mm -hmm. and things that have not been enabled that are within the near-term realm. For example, very selfishly, when we use meta-surface optics, we have refraction and diffraction capabilities, but it's much more powerful because we use in these meta-surfaces tiny structures to induce phase shift in the, in the wavelengths of the light as it travels through. We can manipulate it not just where it goes, but we can break it into its components. I'm specifically referring to polarization. Light falls on an object and it's naturally polarized and you wouldn't know it because you can't see polarization. Machines can't see polarizations. With meta surface optics, we can make polarized light visible. In addition to 3D sensing of the table, we can tell you what it's made of, we can tell you what's beneath it in a way that's not possible today. That will get a whole nother level of information to the people that develop games, the people that develop AR applications, specifically in the enterprise space, when you think what HoloLens is doing, what um, Magic Leap 2 is now doing, and trying to overlay the real world with what's being seen. We add more information to what's really out there. Material characterization is capable in tiny form factors to really give a whole new level of innovation beyond of what we spoke earlier. We make it smaller, we make it cheaper we also make it more powerful. And with respect to seeing and sensing, having that extra information to the user, which is the application developer or the use case developer, is extremely powerful. And that's where people get surprised when the topic of the panel is digital optics. Uh, digital optics, you know, I have analog optics. Why do I need digital optics? And that's when the lights go off and they say, wow, I had no idea. Because we humans can't see it, we think it's not there, but it is. So it's we're bringing exciting. it out using meta surface optics to give that extra layer of capability. That's really exciting. It's like a superpower, extra yes. su supervision <laughs> that you didn't have before. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, when Facebook announced meta like a year or two ago, right? I mean, it, it's just like, what is the metaverse? OK, well, you put a big thing on your head, and then you can walk around and like talk to people, maybe. And now you're talking about like actually detecting what, like with AR and VR technology, detecting what materials you're actually looking at. I mean, like that's uh, definitely the night and day difference. Uh, than what I think people would typically kind of expect uh, out of it. Um, how, I, I don't want to ask any predictions about like where we're going to be in a year or two years, unless anybody wants to take those questions, because <laughs> those are really fun. Um, but, uh, but what do you think is the next big development that you're anticipating maybe seeing uh, this year that, that maybe consumers will start to see? Or are we still a ways off from more widespread adoption of, of the next like big leap in technology? I think we'll see improvements in the, the VR headsets that are, are coming, but everything towards the AR where we've been talking, uh, I still think this is some years out, maybe I mean, t take a guess 2025 or, or six or something, but it, it's, it needs those, those further years yet to, to get. In terms of the VR though, I think this is improving all the time, there's uh, uh, new, new ones coming. Um, I'm quite excited at the moment though, you, in here you can see like the, the glasses form factor, right? And it's not this full immersive view, uh, field of view that, um, that we've been talking about, but it's really indicative of where it's going. And I think that this is really important and is, is a key, key step. So you know, little, instead of having a smartwatch, you can, you can put on your glasses, you can have that sort of information. I think that's a, a really key important step and I really uh, hope that they have commercial traction with those those devices in the next year. I wanted to check to see if there were any uh, audience questions. It looks like we do have a question in the audience. So, or, oh, that's just you turning no. the mic on. Uh, <laughs> did anybody have a question? I can send a mic over to you if anybody wants to get my attention. Not from this audience? Okay, and we'll check with our online viewers yes, as well. Yes, we'll check. Uh, but, uh, I, we're pretty much at the end of our panel in, in any event. So, uh, any parting words about just like what you're most excited about right now, and what people should keep an eye on at CES, maybe while they're here? Lars, you want to start? So, um, I, I 
think it's really what we discussed here in a way is that augmented reality, the glasses are getting better and better. And as they're getting better and they go beyond what Meta has done with the Ray-Ban glasses, they become even user-friendlier and more capable. I think you will find the user acceptance grow up exponentially because all of a sudden it's useful and seamless and it's not a drag and you don't look like a weirdo or so. And, and I really think that we're very close to that with some of the innovations that you see at the show that have been in the work for years. Because your eyes right in front of you, you wear this thing anytime, you don't need to grab your phone or you go to your computer. It's, uh, it's really the best user interface you can imagine. So I'm very excited about that. Awesome. Let's, let's go to Julian next. Yeah, Julian. Yeah, um, so as Richard and uh, Jacob, Jacob just said, I think AR Glaze is a technology to allow you to see the digital information overlaid on top of the real world, right? And uh, it may potentially make your life easier and more engaging. And uh, I think uh, the technology is still uh, new and a lot of room to uh, uh, improve and for the innovation and growth such as uh, we, we just talked about the new material to be uh, developed and the new process has to be uh, innovatively created. Right? So um, I believe after the technology improves, it will be the mainstream by end of this decade. And uh, um, then will revolutionize the world. And, and again, um, I'm super excited to see the material being, because we are material supplies, so the new material being developed and to make the, the, enable the, the technology to different level. Um, I, I just want to say, um, if, if you remember or you have ever watched a movie called uh, Kingsman or Spider-Man, so they, they, can, they can see everything, control everything uh, by the glass, right? So it's, it's no longer just a movie. It will become part of your life very soon. Great. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, Jacob, anything people should keep their eye on while they're here at CES? Yeah, I think for this year, the, the big announcements are around VR. Uh, so you, you know, you'll have more info on, I think, Sony's uh, PlayStation VR E2, uh, which will probably be, be the largest seller of VR you know, within the gaming market. So that'll be something uh, key to look at. So as mentioned, you know, gaming really is that first step, but also there's um, industrial applications. Um, and there are companies such as Vucic who announced uh, some of their smart glasses, or smart uh, safety glasses, actually, uh, which I think you, you can really find some good uh, applications, is adding value to the workers in, in the production space or the logistics space where they can see uh, what's going on with things around them. So uh, those are, I think, probably the two main areas to look for at CES. Yeah. Great. Yeah, Richard? Yeah, I would just echo the, the same. Um, but those glasses are, are hitting a very lightweight point as well, which I think is a key key thing. So if people look at those, they, they can see what we're talking about and imagine, imagine where it's going. Awesome. Well, uh, keep an eye out for better form factors uh, if you're watching this, and keep an eye on the metaverse space because it's always evolving and uh, improving, expanding. And keep an eye on EMD here at CES because tomorrow we're going to have two more panels, one on data collaboration, which should actually be super exciting, and one on artificial intelligence, uh, some of which is powering and making possible some of the innovations that we're seeing in this space today. Uh, so again, uh, this is uh, EMD. Welcome to our CS panel. Thanks for coming to our CS panel on the Metaverse, and uh, see you tomorrow. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.